OK, good morning, everyone. Glad to see so many faces here. Um, we're going to cover, I'm going to cover Eurodynamics. Um, basically, the basics of Eurodynamics. So those of you who are uh, maybe not quite so familiar or just need to go over some of your questions, like about the basics of Eurodynamics, hopefully this will answer um, your questions, OK? So really, what is Eurodynamics? So it's de defined by the International Continent Society as a study of, and, um, of the function and dysfunction of the urinary tract. According to the definition, urodynamics is the only way of understanding why people are continent or incontinent, because the attempt to gain that understanding is what constitutes urodynamics. So you've got a patient who's having trouble um, with the continents, incontinents, who want to understand why these things are happening, we order urodynamics. The components of urodynamics are basically the uroflow, which that's when the patient sits down without anything inserted, just a straight uroflow. Systometrogram, EMG, and pressure flow are the meat of the test, and then a post void residual to measure how much is left over after urinating or after the pressure flow. So, what is a uroflow and why do we do it? So a uroflow consists of the patient voiding so we can assess their flow rate and flow pattern. It is the clue and answer to many issues in um, urology, BPH, um, pelvic floor dyssinergia, just to name a few. Um, at times, the pelvic uh, EMG can also be done with just a straight uroflow. It also gives more information about the pelvic floor um, muscles, the tone uh, of the muscles themselves how, uh, it, whether they are uh, weak or too tight. So it's a good idea if you're um, able to do it, to do an EMG along with just a straight Euroflow. And then the flow pattern itself is a great indication of um, voiding issues. And you'll get a little bit more information on that as you go into the rest of your testing. But a flow pattern can show you whether someone has um, suspected BPH or, um, Again, a very tight pelvic floor. And then um, also then after we do the Euroflow, we measure a post void residual to see how well the patient empties their bladder. So this is um, a depiction of a normal flow pattern. You can see a nice bell curve there. It's like perfect. This is one from an intermittent flow pattern. So again, is a, some, it could be a guy with BPH, um, someone who has just very tight pelvic floor muscles. The systometrogram, which is the part of the test where the catheters are inserted, the pressure flow catheters are inserted, and the bladder is filled with water, and we're watching um, what is going on with um, how the bladder fills and our tracings on the urodynamics. So the systematogram is a mechanical aspect of the aerodynamics testing, focuses on the technical demands of accurately measuring multiple pressures, urinary flow, and EMG of the pelvic floor muscles. That is what the systematogram consists of. The pressures included in the systematogram are PVS, which is uh, pressure inside the vesicle or inside the bladder, PAB, which is pressure around the bladder, so that's usually where we put the um, rectal catheter or vaginal catheter, and then PDET, pressure, detrusor muscle pressure, which is the difference between the PVS and the PAB. All right, so the CMG, like I kind of mentioned before, is the meat of the urodynamics test. It measures um, the pressures inside, around, and of the bladder muscle or the, det or the detrusor muscle itself. It indicates the reaction of the detrusor muscle, which we are looking for reaction of the detrusor muscle um, as we are filling the bladder. It's a great indication of um, what is causing incontinence, over, overactive bladder. Um, people who uh, say that they um, you know, leak, we want to see what type of incontinence it is. Is it, is it stress incontinence? Is it urge incontinence? So we're going to watch the pressure of the detrusor muscle on our tracings to see what actually is causing the um, incontinence. And the reason for CMG is what we're replicating what, um, the nat the, what naturally occurs with a patient. Why are they in here? We're trying to figure out their complaints. So we're, um, when we do the urodynamics, 
we are trying to replicate that complaint by we're filling the bladder with water, just as the body would fill the body or the bladder with urine. And we're repeating that process and getting a tracing on it and able to read that tracing and figure out exactly what their issue is. Okay, so again, the pressures we are measuring, I went over earlier, but the PVS is a vesicle pressure or the pressure within the bladder. The PAB is the abdominal pressure and it's the pressure surrounding the bladder. Um, and the reason we do that, so a lot of people ask, why are you putting a catheter in my bottom? Most people don't like the idea of that. But it is to measure the pressures around the bladder. The abdominal contents can affect the bladder pressure. And so we measure, we use the uh, rectal catheter to measure the pressure around the bladder so we can get a true bladder pressure um, to know how the bladder is behaving. And that is how we get the PDET or the detrusor muscle pressure. And again, the detrusor muscle um, pressure shows the actual activity of the detrusor muscle or the bladder. The bladder and the detrusor muscle are basically one and the same. This is a depiction of just the anatomy of the bladder, where it sits in the body, and um, you can see, uh, kind of get a general idea of um, why, how the abdominal contents would sit on top of the bladder. You can see where the uh, urethra is in relation to the bladder body itself. You can see the muscles there um, that form the urinary sphincter that help hold off. Um, that's what should keep us continent. The bladder, um, the sphincter should be tight enough, the muscles should be tight enough uh, that we're not having const uh, constant incontinence, but yet not so strong that they don't allow us to empty freely without having to really work at it and push at it. Again, this is another um, picture, and this just depicts the different pressures that we're looking at when we do urodynamics. So you can see on top the, um, the PAB pressure is, uh, again, pressure that um, is exerted on the bladder from the contents surrounding the bladder. And then PDET is the um, actual muscle itself, the pressure of the actual bladder muscle itself. And then the PVS, you can see that is the actual pressure that is within the bladder. So the, another um, component of the of urodynamics is EMG. And so why do we do it? So first off, if you're familiar with urodynamics, um, EMG is, um, there are small sticky patches that are EMG patches, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, that you apply um, near the anus, like uh, at three and uh, nine usually, and you put a ground patch on a bony prominence of the body. And um, we use EMG to measure the pelvic muscle floor activity and the function of the um, sphincter. We want, again, this tells us, is, are the pelvic floor muscles really tight? Are they not allowing the body to empty properly? Um, and that's a big issue, or it's one of the things you look for in neurodynamics. You, again, that's where you see kind of that intermittent voiding pattern. Um, these people are great candidates for pelvic floor therapy. So it's just, there's a lot of components here they can look at and refer patients off for different treatments by looking at the EMG itself. And this is um, an, a pretty normal uh, urodynamics tracing. You can see the different components or the different lines indicated there. So the first line on top is the vesicle pressure. So that's what a, a really great urodynamics, someone who doesn't have a lot of issues, would look like this. The vesicle pressure on the first line, just kind of the, the bladder is being filled with water. Um, that first line is just kind of smooth. The, uh, the bladder itself is not reacting it's accommodating um, the fluids that are being put in the bladder. And then the abdominal pressure, the second line, that's where we would have the rectal catheter inserted. And again, just a nice, smooth, straight line. And the detrusor pressure next is the difference in pressure between the vesicle pressure and the abdominal pressure. And it's showing us exactly um, the pressure of the bladder muscle. And again, nothing happening. This bladder is accommodating very well to being filled with fluid. And then EMG also, it's what we call quiet. Um, you can see it's kind of a pretty steady pattern across the bottom there. And that's exactly what 
patients would like to see, we'd all like to see for our patients. Um, but so this is just a, a very normal acting bladder. This is more of a dyssynergia pattern. So you can see um, towards the end of that graph there, this is a patient who uh, is trying to void. And you can see that bottom line in the red, all that activity going on. This is someone who is trying to urinate. And you can see the EMG is uh, super active. This is someone whose pelvic floor muscles are really tight and they're not able to void real well. And you would see that very staccato, like intermittent voiding pattern happening. This is a patient who, again, would bene probably benefit greatly from um, pelvic floor muscle rehab. All right, so the pressure flow. Um, some people do get pressure flow, the terminology pressure flow and Euroflow confused with each other, and they are quite different. So Euroflow is what we do at the beginning of the test. The patient comes in with a full bladder. They sit down, and we're trying to determine their flow pattern and whether they have um, a large po post void residual or not. Are they emptying their bladder well? Where the pressure flow is when the catheters are already inserted. Um, it's at the end of the test of the, the filling of the bladder. And um, again, we're able to pressure flow because we are able to read pressures uh, because catheters are inserted. And um, we're able to see how much pressure the patient exerts to empty the bladder. Very important, again, we just saw that kind of um, uh, EMG earlier, the slide before, that showed um, the dyssynergia. And um, we also, it's a, uh, we will see like various patterns when you see men with BPH, so they have a prostate that's obstructing, um, you know, the, a great flow, like a nice bell curve euro flow. So the pressure flow, you can get many, many um, pieces of information from that alone. All right, again, this is another, um, a different type graphing, but it sh the, actually the, um, the flow pattern is on the top on this one, and that's another really nice flow pattern. And you can see the purple line is the uh, vesicle pressure, the pressure within the bladder. You can see the abdominal pressure, the green line, just kind of stays steady, and that's, that's perfect. That's what you want um, from your patient. And then the P dot, the red line on the bottom, again, perfect. It's patient's trying, is trying to flow. They're doing a great job. And if you notice, the blue, the light blue line underneath the green line there shows a little bit of activity towards the beginning of the graph. Then it quiets down really well. And that is because the pelvic floor muscles have relaxed. And that's what should happen when someone is trying to empty their bladder. They, the pelvic floor muscles stay kind of tight as we go about our day and the bladder fills and that's how we stay um, continent. But then when we sit down and try, we get the, you know, the muscles get the message that it's time to empty, the pelvic floor muscles should relax and allow you to flow in a nice perfect pattern there. And then um, they'll tighten up a little bit again just to go back to the state of um, remaining continent. Um, this is a slide just, again, depicting like voiding physiology. So you can see at the beginning there, um, you had a nice full bladder. If you go down below that, the red line, you can see where the EMG is active, active enough to keep you continent, okay? Um, and then the bladder gets a signal, it's time to empty. So upon command, the bladder starts to squeeze and you can see where it's starting to squeeze. It's getting a little uh, more and more empty. The EMG line, again, below there in the red is quieting because you've relaxed those pelvic floor muscles and allowed the bladder to empty. Um, and then you go down to the very bottom line and you can see a the flow pattern, which is really kind of nice. Again, it's got more of that bell curve shape pattern. And then we go to the um, other side of the slide and you can see the bladder is going to start filling again. We're going through our normal process of the urine filling the bladder. The pelvic floor muscles become a little tighter to remain um, a continent, and uh, that's a normal pattern. That, that's that's voiding physiology um, in a in a very normal way. So, who do we see for urodynamics? Why should we ask 
um, to have them done? Why should our providers ask us to do these? It's people who are complaining of stress incontinence, so I leak when I cough, laugh, sneeze, or urge incontinence, I can't get to the bathroom quick enough, um, I constantly have to go, I wet myself, it hurts. Um, BPH, so guys with enlarged prostates, people with interstitial cystitis or complaints of pain or I've got to go all the time. Um, anyone who complains of a small capacity, again, not necessarily with pain, but I have to, um, I'm in the bathroom, you know, all the time. I can't figure out what's going on. You know, is it an infection? Is it this? Is it that? And you can't really get down to the answer. Urodynamics is a great way to figure out what's going on. And really, any voiding complaint. Um, those people complain of retention. You know, it takes me forever to go. You do a bladder scan and find that, um, you know, you've got two, three hundred um, mLs of urine left or more um, on someone after they've just gone um, to the restroom. And then um, a neurogenic bladder. People's like, oh, you know, I eight hours and I don't really need to go. And you scan them and they've got like a thousand mLs in their bladder. You know, we're looking for a lot of things with urodynamics. And one of the things, the main things is we also wanna, we wanna protect the health of the patient. We wanna protect the health of their kidneys. Um, we don't want uh, people with overly full bladders to be getting reflux back into the kidneys and causing damage. So there's, you know, it's, it's a fairly simple test once you've gotten used to doing it. And you get, again, a great amount of information and a great way to figure out how to go uh, move forward with um, treatment for these patients. So stress incontinence. Um, basically, we're probably all familiar with that term, but um, it's, what it is is when the vesicle pressure or the bladder pressure becomes higher than what the sphincter is able to hold back. So that's that's the definition. It's often caused by weak pelvic floor muscles. So um, a lot of people, women, will, will uh, blame pregnancy for um, stress incontinence. Some people just have naturally weak pelvic floor muscles. Um, and you'll hear the patient complain, when I cough, I laugh, I sneeze, I lift something heavy, I leak. Um, the question is, is it really stress incontinence? Um, and the reason for that is and we'll talk about this a little bit further down, but um, sometimes stress incontinence, a cough, a big sneeze, can actually cause a bladder spasm. And so that's one of the reasons it's uh, great to do a urodynamics, because you can definitely pull that out with a urodynamics. I've seen that happen often. I, you know, I leak every time I cough, or most often when I cough, or you know, a few seconds later, and you do the urodynamics, and what you find is that the patient is coughed, you don't necessarily leak with the actual cough, but then you'll see a bladder spasm happen, basically what we refer to maybe as an urge incontinence, um, happen after the cough. And so the treatment is totally different, you know, so it's really important to pull that out so that, um, you know, you can give the patient the right treatment, not waste a lot of people's time and money. And this is just a depiction of, again, fairly normal tracing. I just wanted you to see what coughs look like on a um, urodynamics tracing. So you see those spikes there that um, show cough, and you usually like to do three in a row, really give uh, the patient the opportunity to leak if they're really going to leak, if that's what their complaint is. And then you'll see a valsalva there. So like, I have a patient cough three times in a row, then give me a big valsalva, and then cough three more times. Um, you can see there's some... Uh, EMG activity with that on the bottom line there, but that's pretty normal when they're um, coughing or doing a Valsalva. All right, so urge incontinence, um, what really is it? So it's an uncontrolled bladder contraction, and it can occur during the infusion. That's kind of what we're looking at. As we're filling the bladder, again, we want to replicate what's going on in your daily life, your daily complaints. We want to see that happening here. So um, it's an uncontrolled bladder contraction. We're not asking the patient to avoid. All of a sudden, this just big spasm happens. If I know that someone has had um, their complaint of uh, urge incontinence, the standard um, infusion rate for urodynamics is like 50 mLs per minute. But if they come in and complaining of um, urge incontinence, I do a much slower infusion rate to give the bladder a chance to fill better. 
um, and to have the tests go on longer so you can get a lot of good information. Because usually once a patient has a bladder spasm during a urodynamics test, it's almost impossible to continue to fill them um, to any great capacity because once a spasm starts, it just continues. The catheter is in there irritating the bladder, um, so it's just not easy. So I, I will go down to 20 mLs per minute, sometimes even 10. Um, so again, you know, you want to do a chart review or talk to your patient before you start the test to know how to um, uh, deal with these patients with complaints of urgent incontinence. During the test itself, you mean do the like the um, quick clicks? Yeah, um, I usually I usually don't. I just I, but I mean that's not a bad idea. I that is something I teach them about after the fact because that's your perfect patient usually to do that. But um, I I've always found that if I I like the slow infusion that usually helps you know quite a bit. Uh, that's that's my reason for doing it. But that that would definitely work, or at least you could try it. You can try it for sure. Yeah, the quick flex he's talking about. It's a little quick. If the patient's starting to have a spasm, we, those of you who are familiar with pelvic floor therapy, um, we ask the patients to uh, squeeze the pelvic floor muscles. We ask them to squeeze as if you're trying to stop from passing gas. Um, do that very quickly, so kind of a squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, and that may settle down their spasm. Um, so. People who have urgency, frequency, overactive bladder, these are people who are commonly have issues with this, is people with di diabetes or spinal cord injuries, um, or anyone, a lot of people have back, who've had back surgery, um, especially in the sacral area, often they'll say, you know, I didn't start having these issues until I um, had my surgery, or I've got back pain now, do you think that has something to do with it? Um, and, if you send them off for other evaluation with other physicians, they'll find that, yeah, they actually did do have a back issue. Um, so just things to think about when you're in general complaints with your patient. Um, and those who have um, MS is often, often um, the, these patients often complain of urgent incontinence. And then some people just need behavior modification. They, they've just gotten into really bad habits. They, uh, get into the bathroom, or they just go to the bathroom too much. I mean, they try to empty their bladder like they're in there every hour, and it's totally unnecessary. And they come in, you do the test, and it's like you have a normal, very normal capacity. What I, I don't understand your complaints. Then you start talking about, well, you know, did you really need to go? Oh, well, no, I just am afraid that, you know, I might leak or. Um, you know, I, I, I just get nervous about it, so I just go in there. You treat it, uh, you cha uh, excuse me, you teach them some um, behavior modifications, like, you know, if you go every hour, for the next week, I, I want you to go, I want you to wait for an hour and a half between every void, and then keep building on that. I want you to go every two hours, every two and a half hours. And they learn to increase their capacity just by those simple instructions. Um, okay, so this is a depiction of a detrusor instability tracing. So this is someone who's being, their bladder is being filled, and um, all of a sudden they're having a bladder spasm. So you can see a true bladder spasm is a rise in the vesicle pressure and a rise in the detrusor pressure, and the abdominal pressure stays steady. Okay, so you can see that there. You can see a rise in the vesicle and a rise in the detrusor. And the abdominal pressure there, that the line that's flat in between, just stays very normal looking. Um, you can see the EMG, like it's a lot of times when patients have um, detrusor instability, they start uh, guarding. So we call it guarding reflex, where they're squeezing the pelvic floor muscles, trying not to um, leak. So you can see that extra activity there, and then also it kind of just, the EMG goes a little dead, I would call it. What happened is those um, the patient leaked, and the EMG patches are falling off. So that's what a um, that's what you're looking for when you're looking for that uh, detrusor instability, urgent incontinence type spasm. All right, so this is um, just an illustration of different types of incontinence and the um, physiology of it. So um, an overflow incontinence, which that's like you know your attention people, um, neurogenic bladders 
who have no idea what you know what's going on, how full their bladder is, um, maybe someone who likely will need a catheter if they don't already have one, um, but somehow the urethra is blocked. It could be scar tissue or the bladder muscle itself just isn't working. But then they'll say all of a sudden, you know, I just, I just leaked. Um, I don't really know why. Um, so these people, again, great candidates for urodynamics. Uh, you know, you do a bladder scan on them when they come in the office and you would probably find a really full bladder. But basically the bladder just can't hold anymore. It, it kind of topped off, it leaked off um, what it couldn't hold any longer. And then stress incontinence, um, again, you're looking, if you look where the, um, the sphincter muscles are, you can see that they're looser and more open. I think you can see right there how oh, that's a little more open. Um, the sphincter is weak, and the pelvic floor muscles may be weak, and they, uh, the patient coughed, laughed, sneezed, and the urine just comes out. And then urge incontinence, the depiction there is kind of showing the bladder muscle itself is just irritated um, by, for some reason. And the bladder muscle starts to spasm, and the sphincter can no longer um, you know, hold back, and the pressure's gotten too high. These are the people who are running to the bathroom all the time. I gotta go now, I need to get into the bathroom quick, um, because the bladder itself is spasming. And um, so urge incontinence, people. So BPH, so uh, as we probably all know, that's an enlarged prostate. Most men end up with a large, enlarged prostate um, uh, through their lifetime as they get older. Um, these guys can often have large capacity bladders. Um, well, you know, they'll come in with complaints, I'm not urinating very well, my urine stream is slower, I get up at night. Um, and what is happening is the bladder, it's the bladder is, um, the urethra is being blocked by the uh, enlarging prostate. And it happens over time, it usually happens quite slowly. So what happens is the bladder is able to accommodate to holding more and more urine um, over time and um, loses its capacity to really squeeze and empty fully. Um, and you'll find these guys on the pressure flow, they have a really high detrusor pressure um, because they're, they are pushing for all their life to try to empty that bladder, but the prostate's basically just kind of plugging it off, and they, many times they have a very slow trickling stream. And this is just a you know, depiction of where the prostate sits in reference to the bladder, and you can see that the prostate surrounds the urethra, and um, so as it gets larger, it's going to squeeze that urethra basically almost shut. All right, and this is a BPH pressure flow. So you can see the, uh, the top red line is kind of cut off a little bit there, but that's the vesicle pressure the patient's trying to squeeze to go. He's also, the second line is abdominal pressure. So often they're like bending over, trying to push harder to um, empty their bladder. So that's why you've got some pressure on the abdominal line there. And then um, you can see the vesicle or the detrusor pressure next below there. And um, it's kind of, you know, not a real steady pattern. And um, it's rather high, uh, high pressure to try to get that bladder empty. You can also see the EMG line, the red line is very active. We really don't want to see that. That's kind of the muscles and fighting the, um, the bladder. Uh, the pelvic floor muscles right in the bladder. And then you, the last um, line there is you can see the pattern. It's not a nice bell curve. Um, it's intermittent. It kind of stops and starts. So that's very typical for um, a guy with BPH. All right. And so I see in small bladder capacity patients, um, these patients are usually very uncomfortable at the start of the filling of the bladder. If they're just a naturally small, some people just have small capacity and um, they just can't handle much fluid being put in. I see people are in pain. They can't handle much fluid being put in. Again, if I feel like, okay, I, you know, you read the chart, you know this patient, you're gonna do a slow infusion. And I mean, I've had people literally like, they've got 10 mLs in and they're like jumping off the table in pain. Um, you know, do your best to talk them into trying to just go with it, but 
if you can't, you can't. You can't force them to do what they don't want to do. Um, but again, very small volumes. And, um, you know, you got to refer them back to your provider and just, you know, I can't get anything done here. We need to look at this in an, another way. I see patients need cystoscopy to figure out what's going on. And there's definitely treatments available for these people. Um, depending on what it is, again, pelvic floor therapy is another good option depending on um, exactly what's going on. You can teach them some relaxation um, methods and, um, again, some behavior modifications, some bladder training where you teach them to, you know, if you're in the bathroom every half hour, I want you to wait for another, for an hour, just force yourself to wait an hour before you urinate and then out for this week and the next week, an hour and a half, and try to build that bladder capacity for them. So how to prepare your um, patient for urodynamics. Every, there's probably you know, 50 different opinions, but these are just some of the generalizations. Um, you want your patient to arrive with a comfortably full bladder. Uh, you're gonna do your best, hopefully, your people who are checking patients in are gonna let you know, you know, this patient, your urodynamics patient is here. They, I have a, you know, their bladder is really full, so we need to get them back so that we can do their uroflow, right? We want to start with that. So they can come in, sit down, and urinate. Some people like to pre-treat with antibiotics. Some like to do, your, give antibiotics after the test. There's various opinions on that, but it is something that people do. Um, let them know there's some minor discomfort with um, catheter insertion. Obviously, you're going to do your best to make that as comfortable as possible. That's what I tell them. I say we use lots of lubrication. You know, um, most people don't react, you know, horribly with this. Um, and then let them know your bladder is going to be infused with water during this during this test. It's basically the same as your body would do if you're it's being filled with urine. We're just doing it in a much quicker fashion. And um, they're always worried about whether they'll be able to empty their bladder. You know, when I'm going to say I'm going to get you maybe uncomfortably full, um, will I be able to pee? And it's like, yes, once we're done, we just want to get you to a point that is full for you and you will be able to empty your bladder. Um, and then just post-test and for, um, you know, instructions. It's possible that you could see a little bit of blood in your urine. It's possible you could get a fever after this or have, you know, really bad urgency frequency. You need to call us with those situations so that uh, we can test you for um, a UTI and get you appropriately treated. Um, the other thing is to have them increase their um, fluid intake immediately after the test for the next, like, 24 or 48 hours or so. Flush the bladder from any possible um, bacteria. They can take an over-the-counter pain relief, Motrin, something like that, whatever they can take. I advise them to do that after they leave from the test just to kind of give them some, um, just deal with some of the discomfort from putting in the catheters. You can also tell them to soak in a warm tub or apply a warm washcloth down below. And um, again, we talked about, you know, there's an increased risk for UTIs, so let us know if they're unable to void or, you know, increasing desire to void, um, if they have fever or hematuria. So these are some of the things that are common during, during pre-testing, all right? Some uh, places want you, the patient to sign and con, uh, inform consent, consider the procedure. Um, I don't see that that often, but it, isn't, it is possible. Give them an antibiotic if that's what your um, practice decides that they want to do. And then after all that, we perform the Euroflow. They sit down on the commode with their full bladder and they do um, the Euroflow. After the Euroflow, we're going to do usually a catheterized PVR. We want to know, did they fully empty, right? We don't really, they don't, we don't know what they came in with because they came in with the full bladder. Um, and uh, so we want to know, did they completely empty? And then um, also uh, after the Euroflow or prior, depending, everybody, this is a lot of, done a lot of different ways as well, but you cannot do, most commonly, you're not going to do a urodynamics on someone who has indications of a UTI, okay? Every once in a while, there's an exception to that. Like if the patient had, say, a Foley catheter in, that's their norm, most, more often than not, the urine's gonna look infected. That's up to you and your provider. Um, so some people have a urodynamics chair, some just use their exam table. Um, 
So depending on what works for you, the patient's going to be at least in a semi-fowler's position. Um, you know, if you just have a regular exam table, sometimes it's easier for the patient to roll over to their left side to insert the rectal catheter. I find that easier on a regular exam table. Um, and uh, so I'll have them do that first, and then I'll have them roll back to their back and then insert the catheter into the bladder itself, and then apply your EMG patches. Um, to start the test, you're going to zero the urodynamics transducers, the cables that attach to the um, catheters, you're zero to air. All right, you always want to be at zero before you start reading any pressures. So you're going to attach your transducers to the catheters. There's, some, there's many different systems out there, so um, you have to just go according to what your manufacturer says. Uh, then you attach the water tubing to the um, catheter that's in the bladder, and you begin your infusion. Um, again, depending on what's going on with the patient, like 50 mLs per minute is the norm, but you may want to go slower. Um, after I have about maybe 25 mLs, 50 mLs in the bladder, I have the patient cough, make sure that the catheters are reading well, they're placed right. So if they cough and the catheters are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you're gonna see these nice spikes um, on your flow pattern. Then as the test goes on, you're going to um, mark your sensations on the test. So everybody who has a system knows that, you know, you've got you know, your first sensation, second sensation, sense of filling, those kinds of things. And then the end of this whole filling, after you fill the bladder to capacity and you've gotten your information, the last piece of this is your pressure flow. Again, this is the same slide, but just showing what we do during the test. I have every, I test every patient for um, stress incontinence, uh, no matter what their complaints are. Um, so again, you're gonna do the coughs, the Valsalva and the coughs. Um, just because they don't complain about it doesn't mean they don't have it. So you've got the catheters in, you're doing the test, go ahead and test for it. Um, kind of talked about this already, the infusion rate adjustments, um, you know, just go slower for those who have uh, um, more issues with being filled quickly and, um, but those who do not have many complaints or like the neurogenic people, retention people, you're definitely gonna go at the 50 mLs. Otherwise you would be doing the test for quite some time, quite a bit longer than would be necessary. Um, once I start the infusion with the patient, I usually stop between 150 to 200 mLs just to um, check. This is where I initially start looking for um, incontinence. So, Again, the cough, Valsalva cough, um, and you know you're looking very closely at the meatus um, because what could be a nothing leak to us, a drip out of the urethra, could be a major problem for the patient. And I've had that happen many times. It's like, well, you're, I don't know if I'd even call this a leak, but it's very bothersome to them, and that's what matters. So um, anyway, that's the normal pattern. Um, Pelvic organ prolapse. So say we have, you know, we've got a female in there with, um, uh, you know, a big prolapse. And they're going to surgery to have, um, you know, the bladder fixed. They don't complain of incontinence, but one of the reasons we're doing the test is to see, once we fix that bladder and put it back up in place, will they have incontinence? Because with prolapse, the bladder is falling down and it can often um, close off the urethra or, you know, act as, uh, an, you know, a natural um, way to block the urethra from having incontinence, right? Because it's putting pressure on the urethra, so not allowing the urethra to be wide open. So if they have prolapse, I always um, have them cough in Valsalva without pushing the prolapse back in, and then I repeat that immediately after by usually manually just pushing the bladder back up into its natural position and make sure you're not, you yourself are not putting a lot of pressure on the urethra and um, blocking it. And um, have them repeat that again, cough, Valsalva, cough. 
Um, there's other ways that you can push the um, prolapse out of the way. I've had different providers ask for different ways. Um, you can use a pessary. Um, I've had people use the big swabs to kind of push it up out of the way. You can take um, gauze and actually kind of um, stuff the bladder back inside. Um, some people will use a tampon. So different options. Um, Okay, and then these are the sensations that you look for during urodynamics. Just very basic. First sensation is I can feel the water going in. First desire is, yeah, I think I could use a restroom. It's not overwhelming, but definitely, I, you know, I could. Um, strong desire is I'm, I'm looking for the restroom. I, I definitely need to go. And capacity is I'm going. Um, I, I can't take it anymore. That's general terms. Um, again, stress leak should be done on every patient. Um, and uh, consider the use, infused volume and sensations when stopping to perform the stress test. Some people, I say I stop at 150 to 200, but if people are complaining already at 50 mLs, you know, 75 mLs, that they really feel full, you're probably not going to wait to 150 to 200 mLs to do your stress test because this is someone who's not going to be able to hold. 200 might be their full capacity, right? So, and you want to know if they're leaked, they have, um, you want to take every opportunity to know if they have stress incontinence. That's what they're here for. So if they start saying, you know, I'm getting really full, stop the then um, and do your first stress test. And you can repeat the stress test several times throughout the infusion, as many times as you feel is necessary. I usually go about every 100 mLs, but do whatever you're comfortable with and whatever your patient's comfortable with. Um, okay, oh, and stress incontinence also, the other thing is positional. You know, if you've got the patient lie, laying on the uh, table and they swear they have stress incontinence, you're not getting anything. Have them stand up. I have patients stand up all the time to do their stress testing, um, and more often than not, they will end up leaking because that's what they say. I only leak when I stand up. So, um, again, um, just OAB and urgency. We've said a lot of this already, um, but I, I want to go over again that you might find urgent incontinence or overactive bladder with people who say they complain or people who complain of stress incontinence. I cough, and a few seconds later I leak. You'd naturally think that's stress incontinence. But when you're doing urodynamics, you find on the tracing, they cough, you see the cough, nothing, and you're looking at the meatus, nothing is happening, but within a few seconds, they start having a spasm, and it's urge incontinence, not stress incontinence. Um, and this is just about pressure flow. Again, it's not the same as a Euroflow. The Euroflow is what we did at the beginning without any catheters in place. Um, the, yes, we do the pressure flow when the patient says, I'm really full, and um, the catheters must be in place. If the catheters fall out before you do the pressure flow, it's not a pressure flow. And if you really need to get that pressure flow, which you should, put the catheters back in. Sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do on some patients but make the effort and do it to get your information. And the EMG patches are also, ideally, they are in place. If they've loosened up, fallen off, reattach them, put some new ones on, because you're seeing the activity of the pelvic floor in addition to seeing um, the pressure that the bladder is exerting to void. And then always get a PVR afterwards. You always want to know what's left over in that bladder. Um, and then, again, this is, I, I think, same slide, but shows the EMG guarding reflex, just uh, the patient um, having a bladder spasm. And again, you see that activity on EMG where the patient's trying to hold off, stop that leak, and didn't, it wasn't very successful. You can see the flow um, down there on the line, the void line, the second one from the bottom. So. What do we report on back to our providers once we've done a urodynamics? What, what, what are the important pieces for us to say this is what we um, found? So you want to know, was the bladder compliant? Did it just stay nice and steady, um, kind of a straight line um, as the, you were doing the infusion? If the vesicle pressure rises along with the detrusor pressure, and it's not just like a slow rise, often you get, you'll see just like this you know, straight, um, st 
steady quick rise um, as you're filling. And that's a, that's a bladder that's not compliant. It's not stretching. It's not accommodating the fluid that's going in. These are people who are like, you know, say they fill rather quickly. Um, and the problem there is that if the pressure is rising inside the bladder, so that rising pressure line on the vesicle and detrusor line, if it's rising, we are often, often thinking, is there reflux? Is urine refluxing back up into the kidneys? You've got this high pressure. If it's not coming out through the urethra, where is it going? It could be going back up the ureters into the, um, the kidneys, right? And then capacity, how big was the patient's capacity? Average, we'd say, you know, 250 to 400. That's a pretty average capacity. Small capacity, if they're under like 150, one, even 200, that's a fairly small capacity. And then often you'll see, you know, five, six, seven, 800 or more. People can hold over 1,000. Definitely, that's a large capacity bladder. And then sensations. Did they realize the sensations? How long did it take them to get to, yes, I, I can first feel water going in. If somebody just first feels water going in at three or 400, that's someone without normal sensation, right? Where they should be feeling that within at least the first 100 mLs, um, and often sooner. And then pressure flow. Again, we're looking at that pressure flow. What is the pattern of the pressure flow? The um, detrusor muscle and the EMG, what's going on there? You know, do we have a real high pressure, somebody who's pushing um, to get past the uh, a, a prostate or very tight pelvic floor muscles? So again, we're looking at pressure flow and EMG together. It gives us a lot of information. Um, okay, so post-test. Uh, sometimes you'll have to put a catheter in, and this might be the first time that the patient's ever had a catheter, but you found on the test that their bladder does not empty. Um, and so they might be going home with the Foley in place. That's why we did this test, to figure out what's going on. So of course, that's a whole situation that you need to sit, and not many people are happy about that. Um, but again, we want to talk to them about protecting their kidneys and just their health in general. Full bladders that don't empty um, are a great way to get urinary tract infections, repeated urinary tract infections. Um, and then, of course, for the next day or so, they might have some burning with void. That's because we've put those catheters in. It's not comfortable. You may have had to reinsert them. Just let them know that's normal. Push your fluids. Um, and then, again, do they have blood in the urine? Do they have a fever over 101, 102? They need to report that to you um, so we can test for or treat for a UTI. And then over-the-counter pain relief. Again, I tell everybody to take something after the test just to get them through, and usually that takes care of their complaints. I rarely, if ever, have anyone come back and complain that they've had issues. All right, so how are we in time? Any questions? Are we good questions? Go ahead. We're on time. We have a couple, couple questions, sure. I have two questions, actually. Um, how would you modify the test for pediatrics? How would you modify the test for pediatrics? Um, slow your, you know, watch your infusion rate. Um, some of the systems have, um, you know, when you put the patient's age in, um, it will then give you uh, some uh, a formula to tell you. How, I don't know if you're, are you doing them? No. Okay. Well, your system, the systems I've used in the past, many of them have, like, once you put the patient age in, it has um, a formula that pops up, and it will tell you how quickly to infuse the patient. So that's your biggest thing, right? Um, and you just, it, it is a little bit of a challenge, especially if you're doing babies. I mean, you know, kids that are, you know, you know, four or five years old are, I mean, definitely want the parents in there helping you through it. They, sometimes they just need to be held down um, to get the catheters in. I'm doing, I've done them on infants, and you know, it's just really a matter of someone there first to help you. And really, you're just you're worried about your infusion rate is the, is the biggest thing. After that, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same thing. And then, what about um, insensate population? You know, spinal cord injury, kids with spina bifida. Right. How do you get through that? <laughs> So the second, you know, you test compliance, capacity, sensation, fullness. 
So you can't, that's just it. And I've done several of those too, I've done several spinal cords. So here's the, you're only gonna put so much fluid in the bladder. Like I won't, you're gonna get varying opinions on this, I won't go over 1,000, 750 to 1,000. If you're not getting any reaction by then, and if they're already um, have the injury and are insensate, um, most often the, what you're looking for in those people is uh, spasm and reflux, so often that's what they're looking for. So if they're having the spasm, it's gonna be obvious on the test, right? And um, as long as they are leaking, if they're leaking and releasing the fluid and therefore reducing their pressure, right? So if you got somebody who's having a spasm and if their body is releasing the fluid, then they're gonna bring their bladder pressure down, right? So if, if, I hope that makes sense. But if they're, um, if you see a spasm on your graphic and you're not seeing any leaking happening, then you're worried about reflex. More often than not, you're trying to, you know, protect the kidneys on these people, you know, the renal function. So, um, but again, I won't go over a thousand mLs. I mean, if you don't have your, what more really, you know, do you need? And most of these people have catheters in or are straight catheting depending on their situation. So, um, I mean, it should be, so, yeah, that's what I hope for. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> your inflow uh, fluid, is it pre-warmed or is... Is it pre-warmed? Yeah. If you're nice, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Often not, no. Okay, in virtue of the fact that it may just come off the dock and it's uh, right. winter it's time, that sort of thing. Would that possibly skew you? You know, if it's really cold, sure. I mean, it would make a difference. I've never been in that situation where we at least haven't had our fluids in our cabinet. You know what I mean? They're at least room temperature. Um, I very, I maybe. Mean, but even something at 70 degrees placed into a patient seems rather cold. <coughs> I'm sorry. Would it even be a patient if you had something at 70 degrees? which would be room temperature when you put it in a patient. Yeah, I, pa most patients do very well with that. Again, you know, the cold, um, cold water would definitely be a factor. I mean, that makes total sense. I've just really not been in that situation where it's just come off a truck. I mean, if that's the case, you know, stick it in a sink of warm water or something for a few minutes and warm up your water. You certainly, yeah, you don't want it really cold because of course they're gonna say, you know, I've got enough fluid in here, you know, they're gonna react right away. But um, yeah, we normally, I, I don't know if I've ever worked, maybe one situation, one group that had warmed fluid.